right. Joining me here on Christmas Clatter, making her Christmas Clatter debut is Dr. Emily Zarka from the PBS series Monstrum that you can find on PBS Storied on YouTube. She loves uh, monsters and literature and uh, and all that wonderful fantasy stuff. Dr. Z, thanks so much for joining me here on Christmas Clatter. Thank you so much for having me. Before we get into the reason why you came, just tell me a little bit about yourself because I just find that interesting. I just, I'm kind of a, I'm a nerd myself. I'm not a big on like monsters and stuff, but I love mythology kind of stuff. So like, how did you get into to this, to this field of, of taking special interest in monsters and mythologies? I think you nailed it. I too identify as a nerd in lots of different ways. Um, and I grew up on horror and science fiction. So those were two genres that I always loved, loved reading, loved watching, but didn't really think I could make a career out of it uh, until I had some incredible professors at the University of Colorado who sort of showed me the way and encouraged me to apply to grad school. And then I just dove right in and hit the ground running, said I was gonna write my dissertation about the undead, which turned into a renewed interest of mine in monsters as a whole in folklore and literature and film and media and art. And I truly believe that human history is monster history. So I started billing myself as a monster expert probably before I earned the title, although I can confidently say I have that title now, but it's been a crazy ride and I couldn't be more appreciative. Oh yeah. What, um, you said you did your, your dissertation on the undead. Was that the first like monsters thing that, that really grabbed your imagination as, as a Absolutely. kid? Absolutely. Yes. I've been obsessed with the undead since I was a kid. Some of the earliest horror movies I remember watching are Night of the Living Dead, Salem's Lot, Lost Boys. And those films just stuck with me so much. And as I grew older and started recognizing what I thought were undead characters in literature that no one seemed to be calling a vampire or a mummy or my preferred term, the undead, just reanimated corpses in general. I thought like there's something here because in every culture that I've studied, at least every culture that buries their dead has some kind of undead legend. And I find that thread just so fascinating. Yeah, that is. That's a, yeah, the zombie undead thing. That's always been the one that kind of always grabbed my imagination for whatever reason. And, and I think it's because they're probably so much more human than the others. Yeah, I mean, that's my personal theory is I mm -hmm. think that there's a corporeality of the zombie and the vampire and the reanimated corpse that's different from a ghost or different even from a yeti because it is still not just humanoid, it was actually once human. And I think that both intrigues us and scares us in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, you know, you said something about ghosts and things. Uh, Christmas and ghosts really go hand in hand a lot more than people, on, on you know, believe on the surface and and uh, things and and you got a new episode releasing today on youtube and uh, for those watching this episode there's a card popping up right in here so that card will take you to uh, dr z's video on krampus he is the uh once kind of uh forgotten monster of christmas he's gained a lot of popularity over the years especially in film and uh Still an interesting story, still kind of a uh, wacky and and uh, just a lot to unpack there. So what, what you know, was it just the Christmas season coming up that, that you wanted to jump into Krampus and, and see what that was? That was definitely part of it. Um, I'll admit that I was very reticent uh, to do Krampus at first, um, only because, I mean, we're in season three, but it just felt too obvious uh, yeah. of a Christmas or Yule monster for me. So I pushed like the Yule cat Mm -hmm. um, before we did Krampus, but I have succumbed. And in my research, I actually developed a appreciation for our creepy horned Yule time monster. <laughs> so, so give us the, give us the, uh, Cliff's notes. What, what's kind of the origin of Krampus? So I think the biggest misconception about Krampus that people don't understand is that Krampus, the name actually really only emerged in the 19th century. Uh, previously, the Krampus idea, again, known by many different names, was more of a category of monster rather than a singular individual. So back in old folklore in the Alpine region, uh, Krampus sort of legend started as this amorphous boogeyman, right? It was just something that parents and adults could say to kids like, oh, well, you have to behave or Krampus is coming. And then with the sort of folklore boom in the 19th century, alongside some excellent uh, Nordic illustrators, we developed this idea of Krampus more specifically about what 
he should look like. And I say he because in the legends, um, Krampus is usually male. Although in the Krampus runs, which take place on December 5th, there are a couple troops of female Krampuses as well. Yeah. So th this is uh, mostly like a German tradition. So it's Slavic and Austrian okay. uh, primarily is what folklorists and scholars generally believe now. The German, mm -hmm. I think, again, some parts of Germany, I think Southern Germany in particular, do mm -hmm. believe in Krampus. And there's some threads that we can trace back there. But essentially any place that bordered um, the Alps has okay. a variation of this monster. Yeah. What? <clears throat> why did this monster, you know, a lot of times people say that these things come to exist for like tales of warning and, mm -hmm. and things. So how did how did Krampus get to be like tied to Christmas and coming, you know, on December the 5th and, yeah. you know, cause you always think it's Santa, well, Santa's bringing the toys. Well, you can kind of trace that back to a various different legends of why you give gifts. So why such a stern warning, this, <laughs> you know, this time of year? I think for a lot of reasons, um, Krampus, I think being associated with Santa Claus first, again, that's something that only appeared in the Victorian period. Ah. Um, beforehand, St. Nicholas, which there's a huge, history that I'm not the person to ask about between <laughs> St. Nicholas and then Santa Claus is sort uh -huh. of a secular version of that. Right. But St. Nick's feast day, St. Feast day is December 6th. So he would appear and give yeah little presents to children. Um, and that was more of the gift giving tradition than what we would identify now as Christmas. And Krampus, we actually still don't a hundred percent know where Krampus came from. I think that the strongest theory in my opinion um, is from this concept of the perch, which was basically uh, the actually the first recorded instance of a Krampus was under that name in the 16th century. Uh, Perchton are sort of mischievous alpine spirits. So again, we took sort of this broader category and narrowed it down into something. Uh, part of that narrowing down did occur in Jesuit plays of all places, <laughs> uh, where we had St. Nick bringing presents. And there's some evidence that Krampus with the horns, right, and the goat appearance uh -huh. emerged around that same time because it's the foil to a saint would be the devil. Uh -huh. So right. we start linking this more mischievous monster with literal Satan. Uh, uh -huh. And that sort of, of course, we love, I think, dualities and foils uh -huh. in general as humans. So yeah. it, that just grew and grew uh, uh -huh. in general. And I think, I mean, it's a way to keep kids to behave. I yeah. mean, especially if we think back to not just now, but even older times when this folklore was really formulating in winter, it's cold, it's snowy. So you're stuck inside with the kids primarily mm -hmm. and food might be running scarce. So if you had this boogeyman to threaten them with, maybe they'd behave a little bit better. So I think Krampus was for everyone's sanity in a lot of ways. Uh, but as you mentioned, I think that winter time is a naturally spooky or supernatural time yeah. because of the darkness, because of the closeness, um, but also because of the storytelling that that yeah. sort of enclosure and isolation requires. And again, I think that monsters are meant to do three main things, educate, entertain, um, and also police our culture. And I think Krampus really fits into that entertainment uh, sort of category. Yeah, he does, because... You know, every hero needs a, a villain that's, you know, stronger than than the hero in actuality, you know. Exactly. So there's something to overcome. So that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it, it didn't really hit me. I've I've you know I've heard of Krampus for a long time and and known, you know, generally what it was all about, just being a Christmas fan, but didn't really hit me till now. And I don't know why, but uh, you remember that M. Night Shyamalan movie, The Village? Yes. It's like yes. that just hit me all of a sudden. That was like a perfect Krampus, like Foil. That could have been a Krampus. Yeah, yeah, like type of thing. And it, I have problems with that movie for a lot well, of reasons. I do too. One, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but me being the literature nerd, I swear, and I can never remember the name of the book, but I read a book that was that plot when uh -huh. I was in grade school. And the first time I saw it, I was like, come on, M. Night Shyamalan. Like this is, you stole this from a YA yeah. book, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I had a lot of high hopes for that movie and it, yeah. it let me down. But for some reason that just, for just now, I, I just kind of like. The monster uh, imagery was great. I will give yes, them that. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but the, the, the Krampus similarities just kind of just hit me just now with mm -hmm. that for whatever reason, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't escape me that they were also in Pennsylvania, which kind of has that same kind of, you know, historical, uh, heritage as, as mm -hmm. you know the alpine regions and, mm -hmm. and things now does um 
does Krampus have any ties to any other like uh, uh, Christmas traditions from that area? Like I, I know one um, that's kind of still popular in th- my area. I live in uh, Southeast Missouri, okay. which is a real, I got a real heavy, like Catholic German uh, area in Catholic. Fris- so Belschnickels, there's still people whose grandparents tell of stories of uh, doing like Belschnickel traditions. I've um, never heard of that. And you need to tell me because it sounds awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, the one I know is a friend, friend of mine, his grandmother, um, when she was a kid, it would be like the late 19, 19s, late uh, mm-hmm. 1920s, mm-hmm. and her uncle and her dad would would like go run an errand on Christmas Eve night, and then <clears throat> then their mom would be like, well, it's time for Belschnickel, or no, she'd be like, well, you know, say something about Belschnickel, and then her dad and her uncle would start rattling the windows of the Oh house. my gosh. Yeah. And then if you were brave enough to stick your hand as a kid out the window, you would either get swatted with a stick or they, okay. you would get an orange. And, Interesting. Uh, and then I said, I thought he was telling me that story and I was like, that's a bell schnickel tradition. That, that, I'm not sure if that connects to Krampus, but like that's yeah. fascinating. I'll definitely have to look more into it. But a connection <laughs> that I do see there is that swatting. Um, that's the other thing about Krampus is that, no even though variations of the monster and like the appearance changed over time, like I mentioned, Mm -hmm. one thing that has always been true about Krampus is like him carrying a switch. Uh, Cause that's the thing about Krampus, right? Is he's not just there to scare children. He's literally there to beat them into submission. So the legends of Krampus are if you misbehave, you be beaten. Um, If you were really bad, you might be thrown into the basket on his back and taken to hell or the worst case um, Krampus would actually devour the children yeah. uh, so you have all these different levels of misbehavior which i find again fascinating yeah. and hilarious in yeah. a lot of morbid ways yeah belschnickel i think is more human and he's, yeah. also, he's <laughs> also got a sidekick that's real problematic nowadays called black pete so, yeah mm-hmm. yeah that's but uh, so that fell by the wayside i could see why yeah that. yeah so uh, you, you mentioned the Yule cat. Um, mm-hmm. if you don't mind. Tell us a little bit about the Yule cat. There's a lot of people that, you know, will, will roll to like Iceland on vacation and yep. come back with, with like the Yule ads and the Yule cat. And they're like, yep. have you ever heard of these? And I'm like, yes. I yeah. Have. <laughs> like, of course I have. I'm on a Christmas <laughs> podcast. Yeah. No, um, the Yule cat all, or uh, Icelandic, the Yola Gurten, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, which is unfortunately one of my trademarks. Right. Um, but the Yule cat is in some ways a variation of like the Krampus monster uh, for Iceland in the sense that the Yule cat appears during Christmas time and stalks the streets, peering in the windows of houses, looking for anyone who has frayed or torn clothing. Um, so if you didn't receive new clothes by Christmas time, the Yule cat would eat you, uh, which the clothing thing, I think at first seems kind of bizarre and inexplicable. But if you look at the history of wool production in Iceland, which has been one of their major exports since the Middle Ages, it makes sense because, you know, the Yule cat was in a way meant to encourage people to finish the weaving and the spinning and the creation of the wool that they needed to make clothes. Uh, So I thought that was like a really interesting connection and ingenious of the Icelandic people to sort of tie up, right, this idea of keeping people from misbehaving also with something that was very practical. Uh, for their economic and cultural needs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, and for those interested in the Yule Cat, I'll have the links to that too in the oh, show notes. Yeah. And I'll put it. I'll put another card right up in here. Who doesn't love Where? a giant monstrous cat? <laughs> I'm I mean. telling you, it doesn't <laughs> get any better than that. Well, let's let's head back to the Krampus a little bit because yeah. you know, uh, reading through your bio and and things, uh, you're a movie you're a movie fan. So with Krampus gaining so much popularity in movies and there's several movies that are just called Krampus and Mm -hmm. they vary in degrees of goodness. Yeah. (laughs) Which one, which one or two is maybe your favorite? Ooh, that's a good question. I think my favorite, not because it's necessarily an accurate depiction of Krampus, but I think it merges or bastardizes Krampus and his connection with Santa Claus the best. Um, is the 2015 Krampus, yes. where Krampus is literally wearing like the traditional Santa Claus clothing, coming down the chimney, snatching kids up. Um, I think that is, I feel like they just went full to the wall with like, you know what, we're not even going to try to separate these two things. We're just going to run with them being associated. Probably if I had to get like my film theorist hat on, 
again, to appeal to a more broad Western audience who doesn't know anything about Krampus. Mm -hmm. Again, the idea of like a devil Santa, I think translates a little bit more easily. Yeah, that is a good movie. It yeah. is. What about you? What are your favorites? Uh, I like the 2015 one the best and, mm -hmm. and the others are, are fine. I'm not a big horror movie person, even though I love monsters. I usually don't like them in movies. I just love the mythology of them, yeah. you know, and in the history of them. I'm a real big, like one of those, uh, like, um, I love like the, um, like the civilization stuff, like the old, old okay. civilization stuff mm -hmm. and, and hearing the stories and, and the people that believe that, uh, that, you know, the human race might be actually older than, than what they give us credit for yep. that, that kind of stuff. And, and that all that stuff really interests me because there's so much folklore and it seems like the, mm -hmm. that the folklore of like monsters and stuff, that there's always some like a little bit of truth or, or something in it. Yeah. I think that none none of these monsters sort of arose in a vacuum there was some real world component that inspired their creation so do i think that there was a giant horned demonic you know figure running around the alpine mountains probably not but i think that there again were like real world reasons why that creature was created um, yeah. again as a foil to saint nick as a way to keep folklore traditions even alive right like yeah. making something that was once told in story, something that becomes physical. Because as I mentioned, the Krampus run nights um, or Krampus parades are still something that is practice. And mm -hmm. people have varying degrees uh, of excitement about that sort of holiday because some people um, in, again, the more Nordic countries, or I guess, excuse me, Germanic countries, I mean, we're beaten uh, by Krampuses, you know, within the last 20, 50 years, because oh. there's these troops of people who dress up as Krampuses and run around doling out punishment. Uh, that yeah. being said, most places have sort of, you know, recognized the tourist aspect and the danger. So they have some strict rules about what these Krampus uh, revelers can do. But that's what I think is so fascinating is if we go back hundreds of years, even before it's sort of that legal intervention, the mm -hmm. church tried to get rid of Krampus runs, not mm -hmm. because they were inherently thought Krampus itself or himself was problematic, but because of like the drunken parties that right. would happen uh, celebrating the Krampus, which I just love, right? Because it's one of the few times the church has been like, we're going to let this monster live, just no on the drunkenness, <laughs> uh, which again, I just find hilarious and yeah. amusing. Well, the Puritans outlawed Christmas too because of drunkenness. So. Yep. <laughs> you know, I let just, everyone just have fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just let everybody have a little fun, especially you know, like you said, that that time of year when mm -hmm. you're get just trying to survive through winter to have a little exactly. Fun. It's following the harvest season, following yeah. the growing season, so people yeah. needed a little bit of a break for sure. Yeah, ab absolutely. But uh, uh, well, Doctor Zarka, I really appreciate you hopping on here with me for a few minutes to talk about Krampus. I will have links to your YouTube channel, but. Let everybody know where they can find you on the social medias. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. You can find me on at Zarka Emily on Twitter, and you can find Monstrum on Monstrum PBS on Instagram. Otherwise, just follow us on our storied YouTube channel. All right. And all uh, Dr. Zarka's links will be in the show notes and description. So you guys will be no more than a tap, tap away. And uh, Dr. Zarka, if I don't talk to you between here and there, you have a very Merry Christmas. Have a very spooky Christmas. There you go. Christmas Clatter is a production of Very Merry Media, and remember, keep Christmas hope alive every day.